And we are live! Welcome to Beastly Thoughts Live Podcast, the number one source for video game-related discussion on the internet, confirmed by science, recorded live on twitch.tv slash briarrabbit every Sunday evening, and broadcast throughout the world via YouTube, iTunes, and Podbean. Today, we'll be talking about the latest gaming news and the price of games and season passes, plus much more. What's going on, guys? It's so good to see you. This monitor is so close to my face right now, it's like ridiculous. Like, I love it. I'm yeah. reading. I'm reading text that's this big, but I feel like I have to move my head to read it. <laughs> I like it. I like. Yeah. It. I feel like I'm giving you a dental examination or something. We're that close at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this, no this tooth back here has been acting out well lately. <laughs> <laughs> this is a way to get the audience up close and personal, Brian Rabbit. That they don't get on every show. It so. probably doesn't look any different, but. Skype and my webcam were giving me a ton of issues before the show started. So. <laughs> Like it was way zoomed out, and you could see like the edges of my green screen and all that. So I just grabbed the monitor and just moved it to my face to <laughs> zoom in. <laughs> and now the screen is, I don't know, it's this far away from my face. <laughs> You're doing pretty good, bro. You look, you look great. Man. <laughs> hey, we make fine. it happen. We make it do. Damn fine. I've got to say, um, for part of this intro, uh, Brian mentioned it, but we really have been appreciating the growth we've seen on Podbean and iTunes. You guys are the best. Uh, we've actually hit our 46 follower milestone which doesn't sound like much we're coming up to the 50 so if you guys are hovering over that link which is down in the description of Bri's youtube or in the chat right now head over give us a follow a like a comment and we will be eternally grateful actually i want to do a shout out to the one guy listening from colombia ecuador kuwait and puerto rico hey buen, buen venido wait there's one um, guy who listens from all of those different countries that's a he, bad dude he, he yeah he, man, he well. travels he gets around <laughs> It's one from each, but you know, to our South American brethren. And Wait, he's got a girl in every port. That's a <laughs> bad dude, he's, man. He's uh, he's he's listening to one of the most quality entertainment shows out there on the internet. But yeah, we'd like to. And thank he's doing it worldwide. Yeah, he's uh he's holding it down for South America for us. So yeah, thank you. Do it, do it. Thanks, brother, brothers, sisters, whoever you might be, Mister. We really do appreciate it. We sure do. Guys, we got a lot to talk about. I'm really excited for this show. I always am really excited for this show. I do want to do a couple of pieces of self promotion real quick. Uh, Absolutely. If you guys aren't aware, the Guardian Con uh, stream, it's a charity stream for St. Jude's, is going on right now. It's they're basically going on for 24 hours a day for a week straight, uh, and they got different hosts coming in for four hour blocks. And uh, I'll be on there on Wednesday from eight to midnight. Uh, with the guys from the other podcast that I do, the Destiny Community Podcast. And we're going to be um, raising money for the Little Lights, St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Uh, so if you guys are around, uh, definitely check that out. Come hang out with us and uh, throw a little money toward the kids, man. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. Right. Sure. Worthy cause. I'm going to watch as long as I can because, you know, I have to get up early in the morning. But you will see me Wednesday and I will drop some money. I gotta steal that's it from my, my thing, wife, beastly. and I'll do that, it. That's like that's past my bedtime. I told him it's, that's past it's my totally bedtime. past mine. <laughs> Midnight. Woo. I'm eight o'clock sharp, sharp. Not nine thirty, and that's stretching it for me. You know, when you get up here in age, you know those late <laughs> nights they they become early nights. You know, that early bird you, breakfast ain't gonna eat itself. That's what I'm saying. You got that right. I'm <laughs> trying. To, I'm be, trying to get. You gotta get. I'm up trying for to move thing. toward that senior <laughs> discount, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see, I dream this thing out. I dream of an Eastern time zone. I, I just sit and dream of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm We're dreaming of the Western. I'm dreaming of the Pacific time zone. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's really nice. Three hours back. Wouldn't it be great if you could just hit a light switch and it would go to whichever time zone you needed at the time? Oh, yeah. But but no jet lag. Like I don't want like the body effects of doing that. No, yeah. Absolutely I just want not. it to like, not affect me at all in any way. I, you know what? Actually would be more preferable if I could just cut out sleep altogether. Like I'd have so much more time, so much more time. You know, all this shit I could get done if I didn't have to waste eight to eight hours a day sleeping. But yeah. it, that would be, that would be the worst reality though, Briar, because you would actually notice yourself growing old. It's like, it would be a long ass day. And then all of a sudden one of these <laughs> moments you look in the mirror and you're like a 70 year old. You're like, what the fuck happened? It was one day. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't even take a nap. <laughs> this is bullshit. Dude, think about it though. So, you don't have to sleep. All that time wasted is just—it's all yours now. 
you get a room back in your house. You don't have to have a bedroom anymore. You can have <laughs> you have a VR room. Hmm? Hmm? I got master one. bedroom's are pretty good, and the bathroom's adjacent. <laughs> you can have a have a pole room. You know, just set up a pole with a oh. sofa in the room. Uh-huh. That's better. Than VR I like room. it. Yeah. I knew a guy okay. a couple of years ago. He had a, a poker party at his house. He had a stripper pole in his bedroom. Wow, was his girlfriend hot? Yeah. Uh, he didn't have a girlfriend. He was Shit. single. That was it. <laughs> he was bringing the strippers home. This is a bad dude. He bangs no one at all. The guy's single. He's got a pole in his bedroom for Christ's sake. <laughs> Maybe he was just no using for calisthenics. <laughs> you know what, Gary? You're absolutely right. He's the only guy using that pole. Let's Actually, be honest. Here. Another stripper pole I saw was my buddy started dating a girl, and she had a stripper pole in her own bedroom. Wow. Yeah. Now that Super was cool. she. Well, her, the claim was that she actually used it because you can do like the stripper calisthenics or stripper workout, right? You guys have heard. Yeah, of this, that's right? what that's what they call it. Yeah. Yeah, you know that's it takes a lot of work to go upside down and hang on that pole. It's you know strong core strength stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, oh, <man. laughs> but you, you can never look at a girl the same way after you see that, though, right? My younger brother, who's living in Ohio now, his ex-wife they had one in their first apartment, and when I first moved to Ohio years ago. Upon meeting her and going to their house, she showed me her moves on the stripper pole. Yeah. My brother my brother just sat next to me and smiled. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to look at people the same way after you see that show. Welcome to the family, son. And also, you know, the best video game podcast on the net where we exclusively Ooh. discuss Who's that? Video I'd like games. to subscribe. <laughs> exclusive. <laughs> exclusive. <laughs> exclusive. 12 Talks minutes exclusive. in, we've hit stripper poles. We've hit <laughs> no sleep. Um... <laughs> I can tell you about my new 1440p 144 hertz monitor. <laughs> like, if we tell really about just want to monitor. avoid video yeah. games for the rest of the show, we could do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I want to hear about that monitor, and I want to hear exactly what you've been looking at on that monitor. Hit me All up. Right. I Hit just, I literally, like, I literally came home with the monitor, plugged it in. Now I have four monitors on my desk. It's a real goddamn mess here. I just Jeez. wanted to plug it in, see if it worked. I, I, the goal is, right? I want a G-Sync monitor uh, so I can play you know, with G-Sync on my PC games, but I also want to be able to plug a console into it. It was kind of a... I, I've been looking at 1080p monitors. They actually had this one on discount at Best Buy, so I decided to just pick it up and sh- give it a shot. It's 1440p, so I don't even know if it's going to work out for me. We'll give it a shot, but I have been playing a PC game that I don't think anybody else is interested in, it's called Dirt Rally. Have you guys heard of this game? I've heard of that series before, and of course. I am very interested in it because I'm a fellow VR head, and I understand that it is a VR-compatible title. It is sure. a VR. It's, it's, a VR. It's, it's compatible with the Oculus, um, so you can use Revive to... I have the I have the, um, the Vive, so I can play the Oculus version of the game. Uh, it's also on st- sale right now on the Steam Store uh, for really cheap. It was still $60 like last week, but... It's, I think it's down to like 15 or 20 on the Steam store. The game is a rally cross game, and it's uh, somewhat of a simulation. There's a bit of arcade physics to it, but you basically, you know, you race down dirt tracks. And what I like about rally cross as opposed to most sorts of racing games is that in a lot of racing games, like your Gran Turismo's or your Forza's, the way to get better is to memorize the track, right? Is to Just do lap after lap after lap so you know exactly where to turn in. You know exactly where to hit the brakes. You know, you just get, you learn your car, but you also learn the track. In Rallycross, that's all thrown out the window because each stage of a race is not a loop around a track, but actually like a a road course. And it's down a dirt road or a gravel road or a snow-covered road where you have to, you go from point A to point B and you do it as fast as you can. Uh, And you're not racing against other people on the track with you, uh, you're racing against times and there's, uh, you know, two, three, four, you know, many, many, uh, kind of, uh, what's that? Will they be like ghosts with you? They're not ghosts. You don't see the other cars. Uh, you just see their times and there's different legs of each race and the cumulative score at the end. Uh, the, the person with the lowest time for the entire race after all the different legs, uh, wins the entire race. And what I like about Rallycross, what I've always liked about Rallycross, is that it's not about memorizing the track. It's about 
reacting to what you see in front of you and what your co-driver is telling you. You got a co-driver sitting next to you who's calling out, you know, you got a 60 degree turn coming up in 200 meters. Uh, and then you got a, you know, you got a 20 degree turn coming up in 50 meters. You got a hairpin turn coming and you're just reacting. You're, you're totally, you're, the skill is to keep control of your car while you're going as fast as you can, while you're on snow and you're going over, you're going over jumps and it's just a lot of fun. And I've been playing it with the Vive uh, in VR and it's really immersive because you really feel like you're in that car. And unfortunately, I'm playing with a controller. I'd love to get a, a steering wheel set up because I feel like I'm in that car and I'm reacting to stuff. And I've played other driving games in VR. I played, uh, what's the one for PSVR? Drive Club. Drive Club. Drive Club. Oh, yeah. man. That Which terrible, is, terrible thing. I thought it was fun, right? Because it was my first, my first VR experience in um, actually you, driving. You gave it high praise, yeah. Yeah. When you first played to it. me, it's always been kind of the dream. Um, the, my biggest problem with it was that it caused a little bit of motion sickness and jarring. Yeah. Um, it also the graphics sucked. Uh, Absolutely too blocky. They were too blocky at distance, so you'd be coming up to a turn and you couldn't tell which way you had to go. Right, you you couldn't react because you had to be right up on that turn before you could see the little chevrons painted that told you you need to take a left. I also tried Project Cars on PC, yes. and that had much better graphics. Um, but they do, they don't. This game caused motion sickness for me. Project Cars did. Um, Is it also uh, VR compatible? Also VR compatible. Yeah. Part of the reason for that was I think the in the early game, you start in um, little uh, go-karts, racing go-karts, which isn't super fun. I don't want to race go-karts. I just want to race supercars. Like, that's why I'm here. Like, don't give me a go-kart. Don't give me a Mazda Miata. Don't give me a, a Honda Accord. I don't, don't give me a Prius. Like, I want to race a fucking Ferrari, man. Like, I'm a, that's why I'm here. Anyhow, yeah. it also caused a little bit, when you crash or when you bump into things, it was really jarring. Um. And that's what was causing the motion sickness for me. Not the actual driving, but like any time you tapped anything out that you weren't supposed to, it would immediately move your field of view to someplace else, and it was awful. Wow. So I, I bounced off of Project Cars right away. And not a bad game for on a monitor. Didn't like it in VR. So I finally got around to Dirt Rally. And I got to say, the way they handle uh, crashing and all that stuff is very subtle, and it doesn't... It doesn't move you out of the experience. It's also very fun being in the cockpit and having your co-driver sitting right next to you, telling you what's coming up while you're just reacting to what the car is doing. You feel the only thing missing is the G forces. Like it, really, yeah, it's really cool. It's a cool experience. You know, it's not, it takes a beast of a computer to run it. The graphics take a serious downgrade to, to do it into VR. I mean, the game looks phenomenal on a, on a PC, but when you're looking at a VR, it's a huge downgrade. And Dirt Dirt Four it is out, I think, right now. So Dirt Rally is already old. <laughs> so I played the Dirt series when it was still known as Colin McRae Rally because yeah. that's what they rebranded into. So I played it back when Codemasters were knocking out the old Colin McRae's. I enjoyed it back then. I haven't tried it in VR, uh, but I have tried Project Cars, and I didn't have the same experience as you. What I will say, uh, if anyone is a fan of VR racing, is that Project Cars do offer a vr patch which is community made it's like a mod um, which helps with some of the features that you talk about and adds oh, okay. um, adaptive resolution so the edges of the screen become more blurred to focus on better quality visuals for the center of the screen where you're looking and that works really really well I so have to check that out because i really i did not like project yeah. cars at all i didn't like i didn't like the fact that i had to start with go-karts and i didn't like the fact that when i crashed it was even not Boom. even crashed when i just like bumped into another car it was my my perspective moved dramatically, and that made me. Uh, I don't, usually don't get motion sick from games, uh, from uh, VR games. Real quick, can I just supplement what you guys just brought up? Project Cars is a game that I've had for a long time, and I swear to God, no lie, today was the very first time I ever played it on Xbox oh, One. <laughs> swear to God, my whole family played it. Uh, Nova played it. My wife played it. My son played it. Very first time. I can't believe you guys said that. It was. But continue, Briar. To me, it was just amazing. That you That's guys it. Brought That's that what up. I've been playing. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, for, I think it was seeing forza for the xbox one x just kind of i don't know it just kind of ignited like you know i'd really like a good driving game for for the vr 
uh, even though Xbox One X doesn't have VR yet. Uh, and mm-hmm. Finding Dirt Rally really is scratching that itch for me. It's a really great game. It, it's got me. I've got an old PlayStation 2 steering wheel setup that I'm wondering if it will still work on PC. It's oh, USB. Wow. So I'm wondering if I could just use that. It's got the force feedback and everything. I used to have one years ago, but who knows? I can't even, I have no idea where that stuff is now. Um, I'll quickly go through what I went through. Uh, we're kind of lagging on a little bit. I actually played some VR uh, this week myself. I had a friend over Friday. We played some Tekken. I went through my entire studio and changed everything. So I rehooked up my PSVR. Now I don't have to play it on a monitor. I can play it on my 60 inch. And, um, I think that's probably the reason I've been playing so much. I don't like playing it in the corner, feeling so con- confined in front of my, my computer monitor. And so I played Tekken VR uh, with Tekken 7. And it's basically the exact same game that you know and love as far as Tekken, but you're kind of a spectator as you play. The, the characters you're controlling are out in the middle of this arena, and you can pretty much dictate how far away from the action you are, which angle you view it from. So you're like but the also- cameraman? Yeah, but you play it okay. at the same yeah. time. So you can set it up to where you're right next to the characters, real close to the action, and you can press certain bur- buttons like R1 or R2, or L2 and L1. They'll do different things like zoom up on the action dynamically, like if you do something incredible, or go into slow motion mode. So I played that. I didn't know if I'd like it. It's actually pretty damn awesome. I wasn't. Un- you're unable to play against other people, though. So all you're able to do, basically, is go through the arcade mode. But I thought it was pretty cool. Something I've been wanting to do, uh, I kind of got back into this week, was playing my Nintendo Switch. I haven't played my Switch in a while, guys. It's been a few weeks. And uh, I'm back in love with The Legend of Zelda. Uh, That game just has so much to it. I've been playing for the last two days here and there, uh, taking time, uh, really investing. I probably invested at least six hours probably over the last two two days just playing that game and really getting back into it and enjoying it. Uh, Friday the 13th. This week, that's been the game I've been playing. I know it has a lot of issues as far as the net code and people getting disconnected, but it's a lot of fun. We were actually uh, supposed to play that sometime this week. Maybe we can play it as the Beastly Thoughts crew next week, but it's a lot of fun playing that game. They, they released some free content uh, because of all the issues that people have been having with the game. They released the Retro Jason from the NES game. So if you guys remember the Friday the 13th game that came out back in the, God, the mid-80s, it was a blue... Uh, Jason Voorhees, they actually created that in the modern game with very uh, reminiscent. No, he's not. He's just blue, the same color. He kind of emanates that blue glow that he had in the NES, and they created some Friday the 13th chiptune music to go along with it. So when he's coming, you hear this music. It sounds like a really sick NES game coming your way, but it sounds like Friday the 13th. They also gave you some new um, clothing items for each each of the counselors and thirteen thousand dollars to spend uh, upgrading and, and and really tweaking your character. So thirteen thousand dollars straight to your bank account. That is a generous offer from a developer. I, I wish I'd bought it. If I'm honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Now you know. Knowing's half the battle. But I've been having a lot of fun with that game as well. And. Uh, it's probably my first week in a couple of weeks. I've actually had some time to play games due to what's been going on, but it's been great, and I look forward to getting more into games in the coming weeks. Gary? Fantastic. I've had a very, very busy week, and I'm going to fly through it at breakneck speed because there's a, a lot of titles I've been playing, so we're going to have a, a smorgasbord. It's a buffet of titles. Damn. Uh, first one was Final Fantasy XIV, the Stormblood expansion, which launched last week. So there may be some... Final Fantasy fans on the podcast. I don't know of any myself. Um, yeah, yeah, I but, am actually really strongly considering picking this game up. I've been watching really? a little bit of footage, and it looks good. So it's if you're an MMO head, it is like um, a very, very watered down diet MMO. But that's actually a positive thing from my perspective. In it's a soft transition from single player campaigns. So if you're used to things like Skyrim or Oblivion, where there's a really, really strong narrative story, but with exploration and freedom. That's pretty much what Final Fantasy XIV is. But again, if you're used to things like World of Warcraft or Black Desert, you'll feel that it's maybe too scripted, too linear. So I'd recommend this game to people that want to dip their toe in MMOs, but are okay, a transition game. Yeah, like a sort of like a, a gateway drug onto mm-hmm. harder things. Um, so you take this, and then you'll be you'll be shooting up World of Warcraft directly into your veins before you know it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's I mean it's it's got chocobos, it's got things like seared airship travel, so it's got all the callbacks to Final Fantasy set in an MMO world, and the the master main story quest, you know, the campaign if you want to call it that, that takes you right the way from one to level seventy. Probably takes about 150 
and that's not including all the the other content that you've got in there so great value pick it up uh, it does carry a subscription though so be warned that if you pick it up you'll have to pay monthly what's the price um, monthly 15 dollars something like that i don't know 10 15 dollars it, yeah it's not it's, a lot. It's, i think it's about 13 12.99 is uh the last time that kate and i paid for the final fantasy uh online for the ps4 i think that was what they charged 12.99 a month i've been hearing actually a lot of good play. things about this game lately man people are saying it's a lot of fun the story is phenomenal like it's not it's grindy like an mmo is but it also feels rewarding I, i'm hearing good things about this game Definitely. The story is very, very rewarding. It's heavily voice acted. There's lots and lots of cutscenes, you know, where you, you get in, in game cutscenes to drive the narrative along. And I should have mentioned as well that it's, um, I don't want to get too deep on it, but you guys seem interested. It's got cross play between PS4, yeah. Mac, and PC. So oh, if wow, you've got yeah. the game, you can play with people on other platforms. And also, if you've got licenses for all of them, you can play it on a PS4. Monday, Tuesday, pick it up, play it on a PC, Mac, etc. So I've been playing with my fiance, who's uh, and it's got PS4 Pro support as well. If anyone's into that, and controller yeah. support on the PC as well. Controller support on PC and keyboard support on the PS4, keyboard and mouse. So it really is, you know, straddling all sorts wow, of, of it's boundaries ubiquity. there. Yeah, man, there's there's some sort of inter-platform relationship going on there. It's, and it's, you've been playing it with your fiance, you say. I have, yeah. I mean, she's much higher level than me. Um, I, again, I, I kind of dip my toe in the water with this one, but she's been grinding through. Uh, she's on the PS4, OG PS4. Uh, I've been on PC because why wouldn't I be? It's glorious. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we've been we've been playing through um, and enjoying it, you know, because y- you can you can chat on Discord and, and still have a great time. Something that uh, Kate and I did today, I didn't want to bring it up, but you said you were playing with your fiance. We started playing Nier Automata today. I saw that there were some comments uh, last week in our comment section on Twitch that people were kind of disappointed that I've had this game for a few weeks and hadn't had a chance to play. We played for about two hours today. Really enjoyed it. It's something special. About Any excuse this. not to play Final Fantasy 15, right? Or 14 now. You know, just <laughs> multiple parts of the franchise that you're no, not no, touching. No, no, we, no. We, we put quite a few hours into Final Fantasy 14. Quite a few. Did uh, you do it at launch? Because I heard it's like a completely when they announced. No, 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 2. no, 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 no. No, we yeah. did this right before I moved in a, and I bought my house. Oh, okay. So this is probably about five months ago. We put we played for a, a solid two months straight, but other things happened, and here we are. <laughs> so the other thing that I've been doing is looking at well something that's going to immediately turn Briar off. He's going to turn his webcam off and just walk away at the moment. Uh-huh. Is the Call of Duty campaign marathon? Mm-hmm. So. There we go. Briar, wait. Briar. You used to love See, her, Briar. You the, used to love her. The Not only the Call of Duty. Yeah, you're right. The only Call of Duty campaign I've ever played, um, aside from the original, back at the time when it was current, is Infinite Warfare. So I've missed all of the campaign evolution. So I'm playing this as a bit of a science project. And, and Briar, you were shocked when you saw me on Steam pop up going, Call of Duty, like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you know, the original <laughs> one there. I've actually been playing it through and noticing the evolution of the series game to game. So I completed the first game, moved on and played through halfway through Call of Duty 2 so far. And you start to see when they implemented different mechanics um, and how it's evolved on. And what's crazy is that the whole features of, you know, picking up health packs, there being class based systems set in World War 2 with a really strong narrative. They had that in the first game. Like everything <laughs> that was said there, they've moved away from by Call of Duty 2. Yeah. Um, you know, everything that Call of Duty World War Two is going to be was in COD One, so it was, it was really it was a good big deal it. when they got rid of the health packs. Right, the regenerating health was huge. Yeah, oh, that's oh. returning. Yeah, health packs are returning for COD World I, War Two. I didn't know this. I, I haven't been following closely. Wow, that's going to change it quite a bit. So yeah, my science project continues. I bought every single Call of Duty on Steam. <laughs> of um, course you did. They're they're on. Yeah. Expensive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I buy them from shady grey market sites um, with stolen credit card <laughs> keys. You know, I have I have no shame whatsoever. I'll, I'll rob you blind for a Call of Duty key. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I'm playing through. So, you know, I'll, I'll be mentioning if there's anything good that comes from that watch. Also, talking about the Steam sale, I have gone on and bought over 100 games, like literally gone oh. crazy on them. I intend throughout the summer to revisit some some great franchises. And I've been dipping my toe in some of them to see if I like them. But Call of Juarez, I'll be playing through Hitman, Max Payne, the Hitman Arkham is series. Hitman so good. Hitman, actually, right now, you can play the first couple of levels for free. Yeah, I saw that too. Well, I've got to get through the first five games before I get to that one, Briar. So we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> That's not what we're doing, man. Some of those games are bad. 
<laughs> just play the fun Call one. Of, <laughs> Call of Juarez was pretty awful, but again, to appreciate the the fine things, you got to just bang through them hood rats, you know. So that's what I'm going to be doing. No, in the video you don't. Game actually, franchise. you can have sex with a supermodel without having to bang her ugly sister <laughs> and still appreciate it. <laughs> Man, Gary I, just turned this shit hood real quick. He turned it up to nine. That's fine. Yeah, you know, I, I, I need to. Rats. I need to, to feel the itch and the rush the next day to know what I've, <laughs> I've, I've been missing. Um, the last thing that I've bought, actually, um, before we transition on, is another monitor, Briar. I've been joining you. I felt like you couldn't uh -huh. have all the fun. Yeah. I had to do it myself. What did you get? So I picked up the uh, Asus uh, MG279Q, uh, oh, if you yeah, want to be specific. Sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly that. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> For people that aren't geeks, it's a 1440p, 144 hertz IPS monitor. Um, it's to complement the 4K60 that I've got on the 1080p, 144. And I've got to say, if people are looking to buy a monitor for PC gaming in the future, high-end PC gaming, I want to say, 1440p seems to be the place to be at the moment. Because you can, with a good card, a 1080 Ti, you can maintain 120, 144 hertz in most games. And it still looks stunning. So, yeah, I, I think you're going to really what, see the uh, the benefit there bro with the what, monitor you've what got. price what price range is this asus monitor you, you picked up it's like a thousand dollars like that no uh this one's not because this is the free sync not the g-sync oh okay so, so um i didn't actually mind because if you've got a good enough graphics card to exceed the 140 frames you don't get tearing you only get tearing when your graphics card's not quite meeting the refresh of the screen um, so yeah, from my perspective, I think it's about six hundred dollars, five fifty dollars in the states. So it's not a hugely expensive screen um, in terms of you know what they can be because I know screens can be over a thousand, like Briar said for a G Sync. Um, but yeah, even if you're using an Nvidia card, providing you've got a good enough card to, to do it, I'd I'd recommend anyone to look at it. Um, it's IPS as well, which looks fantastic. Um, really, really good screen. That's the Asus MG two seven nine Q. Uh, if anyone's <laughs> he knows those numbers and letters. Yeah. yeah, I got an Asus laptop, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I, uh, I, I want to go. What, I'll tell you what I really want, Gary, is I want these new uh, 4K monitors with the higher refresh rates in the HDR, but they're not out yet. And when they do come out, they're going to be fifteen hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly, Beastly. <laughs> like that's what I want because you know I I got a PC that can do 4K. I want, you know, and I want the 4K. I'm not always going to be gaming at 4K because, you know, refresh rate is more important to me than resolution. But, sure. you know, when I can go up to 4K, I'd like to go up to 4K. And 4K is also a, a television standard as opposed to the 1440, which is not. So I can also plug in a PlayStation or an Xbox One X into that monitor and enjoy the 4K and the HDR. So it's much more of a multi-use device. Yeah, I, I did pick up this 1440p screen. I'm just not sure if it's going to work out for me because I don't want I don't want to have also a 1080p screen sitting here. You know, I don't want four monitors on my desk. I want three. Yeah, really, I kind of want I mean, two. <laughs> I mean, I know that console at the moment there's a big push for 60 FPS and 60 being great, but I'm going to be honest with you, 60 hertz just isn't enough to consistently game on once you've been playing at. 120 and 144 well, hertz, 60 you looks, know they're still locked in at 30 you know. for everything yeah 60 is still they, like the I'll dream you, man i've been thinking about this a little bit and i think i'm gonna make a video about it i don't know sometime after guarding con but the whole like the whole message that both sony and xbox are kind of pushing out there with this 4k this 4k that mm -hmm. I, I feel like they're heading in the wrong direction yeah it's a cool marketing term it's like megapixels though on cameras it ultimately is less important than having good frame rates. Yeah. You look at almost any PC gamer, and it doesn't matter what resolution their monitor is, what they're targeting is at least 60 frames per second. Yeah. You know, it's just the facts. You know, so, mm -hmm. you, you know, I have a 4K display on my PC. I rarely game at 4K because I, most games I just can't maintain 60 frames per second. Yeah. Very, very rarely. So they, you know, they built these machines with all this extra power. PlayStation did it and Xbox did it. And here they are marketing 4K, 4K, 4K at 30 frames per second. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 60, as I said, to me, I've got a 4K screen and the 1080 Ti can hold the 60 frames. I don't, but that's why I've bought a 1440, 144 hertz, because to me, 60 hertz is still 
really, really choppy. You know, once you've had that higher frame rate, like you say, it, you prioritise that over resolution. Um, yeah, to, to me, uh, I think you're 100% spot on. But the issue is that you can't really promote to a gamer that, that our game is 120 frames per second. You know, that's not important to a console gamer. It's not now, but, you know, if we, if consoles start moving towards solid 60 all the time, you know, Call of Duty's been doing it for years and people appreciate mm. it in Call of Duty. I, I think it's becoming you know, what if, more important. What if we, you know, what if all of a sudden PlayStation came out with the PlayStation Pro and said, oh, and by the way, we put a display port on this. Right. Wow. You know, so yeah, you can hook it up to your TV and it'll run at 60 frames per second. If you hook it up to a monitor with a display port, you can also hit, you know, 90, 100 frames per second. Yeah. But then how many people would that appeal to? I guess it's a niche market. I think market the, same, the same market that they're are buying a PlayStation Pro or an Xbox One X. Like yeah, the guys yeah, that give a shit. That's who it appeals to. You know, a good point. Most people who play... Most people. A lot of the people who play video games a lot are not playing on plasma TVs or LCD TVs. They're buying gaming monitors already. So why not take advantage of those, you know, the features that some of these gaming monitors have instead of targeting 4K? I just think, I feel like they're going in the wrong direction with that. Well, it, it's a long-stemming uh, issue with console gamers. From the beginning, Briar, the, the thing that console gamers have been touting was graphics. You remember we were talking... 32-bit, 16-bit, it was all about the graphics and the way that it was presented on screen. Now, with the power of PC, we can look past that and go to things like frame rate. It's just something that console gamers need to catch up to. As someone who has a quasi-gaming PC that's able to do more than my PS4, I understand the importance of frame rate. I've seen games running at 30 frames per second now, and I've seen them running at 60 frames, and I understand that there's a huge gap that needs to be bridged. I think that yeah. uh, I think that hardware developers, I think that video game developers need to uh, not so much tout this 4K issue. It's like a lot of people don't understand the, the GPU versus the, uh, the 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 resolution. I, I bought a laptop because I wasn't a PC guy that has a 4K monitor. It was touted as a gaming laptop that only had a GTX 960M in it at a 4K 4K monitor. Those two things do not coincide very well. The GPU can't really hold up when you go to 4K mode in any games. And so you're getting 20, 15 frames per second. And yeah. that's the thing that a lot of Great console gamers don't. <laughs> yeah, let's pause <laughs> this and look at it. Ooh, it looks beautiful, right? Yeah. A lot. That, that's the thing that console gamers don't really understand. So when console gamers hear Microsoft or Sony say 4K, true 4K, not 4K, people are still in that graphics mindset versus the overall experience, which is, a, a good frame rate with a, a beautiful image. It doesn't have to be 4 and 5K. I'd rather, at this point, have a 60 frames per second game than a 4K game, and that's my personal opinion. I mean, to close off and, and sort of leave the point there and move on to our news, I think as well, I just want to make the point here that we're not saying this is console gamers. I think that's probably the wrong term. Let's say casual gamers, because I think PC can have casual gamers that aren't yeah. interested in frame rate just no. as much mm -hmm. as console yeah, gamers. Absolutely. I'm really, when, I, when I'm talking about this, I'm really looking at the top. I'm looking at the guys who are, you know, creating this stuff and marketing this stuff, and I feel like they're they're missing their opportunity. Missing the message, yeah. 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 Talking about guys at the top and messages, have you heard the, the messages from Microsoft around Horizon? Uh, there was a job posting on LinkedIn this week uh, for a lead environment artist, and the job posting um, at Microsoft said that they want someone to work on a game similar in size, scope, and setting to Horizon Zero Dawn. No further details have been announced of what this project is or whether or not it will get the scale bound treatment. What do you think to use the actual name of a competitor's game in your job posting? <sighs> you know, some people are going to hate it. Some people are going to love it. But if something's successful, you know, and you emulate it, I, I think that's business, man. They're not uh, using it for marketing. They're literally, they need somebody who knows how to make a game like Horizon. They want to make a game like Horizon. They're, they're using this to find people who know how to do that shit. I have no problem with this. This is a game that we won't see for four plus years. <laughs> it's just, you know, hey, I, it happens actually frequently. You know, we, we've seen companies hiring for uh, people who can make a Destiny-like game. Or know, a Grand Theft Auto-like game. We've seen tons of that, you know. Yeah. 
So our next piece of news is directed straight at our listeners and viewers. And, and Scalebound was actually cancelled because of you. Yeah, that's all of you right here. Um, Phil Spencer has issued an apology this week addressing the fate of Scalebound when talking to Gamewatch, the Japanese news site. He shared that the cancellation hurts him as much as it did fans, uh, and he is disappointed uh, as much as everyone else is. The actual reason stated was that uh, Phil believed that the hype that the game was an, well, the game was too early, uh, announced too early, sorry, and it generated far too much hype, causing pressure that turned out to be detrimental to the game's development cycle. <laughs> and eventually, fan expectations exceeded that to which the studio could ever actually deliver upon. What do we think then? Do we think that fans overhyped it and held this as the one holy grail of Xbox Get to a the point hell that they just couldn't deliver it? No, that's totally not true. There have been many games that have been hyped beyond belief. Look at The Last Guardian. The hype for that game was just unbelievable. And the game didn't live up to even the lowest degree of hype, in my opinion. I think that Phil I don't Spencer's know, man. You were pretty hot on that thing when we were talking I about was it. Hyped. When it was I new. was hyped. I was hyped. When you were playing right? it. Yeah, after I beat the game, watch my review. I mean, my review says it all. It, I mean, it is a, a, a Team Eco game set in the same world as one of my favorite games of all time, Shadow of the Colossus. So you think after a game of that pedigree, you're going to get more of that. But when you play the game and you experience it, you can see all the issues that it had. You know, just that's I mean, just my opinion. The the hype. I don't think the hype for this game was really the issue. I think the issue was the developers didn't come together with a cohesive plan for this game, and they might look at what people wanted, but really the audience doesn't dictate what you make. You can only be hyped by what you see. So what they've shown in their the trailers. Only thing that they'll just happily push a game out that's under on the hype. I mean, No Man's Sky. Did anyone remember that one? That that great Sony. Briar, uh, Briar remembers that game. I like that game when it came out. <laughs> I was enjoying it. I think Microsoft I just cares. It. Really? Microsoft cares <laughs> yeah. about the values of their consumers, basically. You know, it's nice to have a company that, that care. Right. Um, talking about companies that care, Microsoft <laughs> have got more Xbox exclusives on the way. Phil Spencer confirmed with Waypoint that big new exclusives do exist, but they're not in a position to show them to fans. In a soft jab at the business practices of their competitor, Spencer said, we are investing in new things. We have signed multiple projects recently. From a PR standpoint, I thought, hey, it would be easy for me to throw these in a trailer and not have the game released for two to three years. But that's not what I want to do to our fans at Microsoft. Hey, man, I can't do nothing but love and respect that. I mean, yeah, all's fair in love of war. I mean, Sony, I feel like, is under fire for having done that now too many times. You know, I, hey, they see a weakness, they went after it. Good on mm -hmm. Phil Spencer. Good on I mean, Phil. It's very hard no to wrong. not love Phil Spencer, man. I mean, it's really hard to dis or dislike Phil. He just carries himself and always seems to say the right fucking thing. You, you gotta love Phil Spencer. The golden I mean, child of the gaming industry right now. You know, the guy can do no wrong. <laughs> every, every, time, that lasts. <laughs> every, every time I hear Phil Spencer talk, I go out and I buy an Xbox figure. This makes, <laughs> makes my day. Should, they should start selling Phil Spencer figures. You know, yeah, like I'd buy one. Figures. Does it have Does it have his big swinging dick that he showed us in the <laughs> Conan Exiles dick slider included on every Phil Spencer action figure. <laughs> it got bigger after they showed the X, too. Well, excited. if Phil Spencer is the hero of the gaming industry, then I think Sony are slowly becoming the villains. PlayStation <laughs> boss Shuhei Yoshida said in an interview with Jagger Play that there are things that we have held Things that we have chosen not to show during this E3. Of course, there will be more exciting news coming this year when our teams decide it is ready to share it. Uh, it seems like Sony did not want to share the limelight with Microsoft or Nintendo. And Jim Ryan has echoed that, stating that Sony are gearing up to host their own showcase later this year. And you guys are not invited. So what do we think about Sony <laughs> holding back games from E3? Home. I know. <laughs> Screw you guys. Are well, Sony becoming the bad guys? What no. happened to For the Players? For the Players. We're reaping the benefits of that now. PlayStation gamers are loving it, man. I mean, of course, we all like the whole idea of the Xbox One X, but right now, PlayStation gamers have the games. I think that's very smart uh, for Shuhei Yoshida to hold something. They got PSX coming. That's going to become, sooner or later, their premiere showing. I mean, every year they show great things at PSX. They don't want to blow their whole load at E3 to try to compete with the Xbox One X when they can come out at the end of the year and really they bring got games new... Com. Yeah, I mean, they, they've got Paris Games Week. they got everything that they've got to show stuff at. They can't just blow their load because there's a new console on, on the horizon that's being shown. And I think that's a smart thing to do. Not what the villain the, uh, thing. 
the waves of, of doe-eyed ponies who were standing in the audience thinking, Sony's going to win. Don't worry. They'll come. It's fine. They didn't win. <laughs> I mean, they let you down. I would have been in that audience down. like this too, man. What are you going to do? Sony didn't win. And, and you can't win every single show. You know, Sony's been winning E3 for the last two or three years. I'm happy that Microsoft came out and won. Microsoft did everything right this year. And I think it's good for everybody. You know, if, if, if Xbox loses every single year, everybody's going to lose excitement for that brand. The fact that they came out and reinvigorated their audience and brought people from PlayStation side over and got them excited about Xbox, I think it's great for everybody, man. This story win -win. really is more about E3 and, like, the struggles of trying to put on a conference where everybody has to share this limelight rather than, like, looking at Sony individually. Because if I was running Sony, I would be way more interested in, you know, having all the attention to myself at an event like, you know, they have in December. PSX. Yeah, at yeah. PSX. Or, you know, like, if I'm going to show off my new console, have an event where the all of, like, all the gaming Everybody's there for like, you. Yeah. As opposed to where Xbox has to, you know, the way they did it is they had to share, you know, all of the their attention with everything else that happened in E3. And, I mean, how many people are really talking about Xbox One X right now? A lot of people are talking about this game, that game, I saw this, I saw that. The Xbox One X isn't really getting that big a discussion. Absolutely if right. Xbox had announced that or shown it off at an event in August like Sony had, would it be a different story? I don't know. What do you think about it, Gary? Do you think that Sony's really being a victim here, or was that just the talking point of the article? I feel like Sony are maybe going against the spirit of E3 a little bit in what they've done. I think E3 was always this big, boombastic show. You can talk about it from a business perspective, but I think E3 is hopes and dreams. And they seem to be bringing it hard enough at E3 when they needed the publicity and the positive sentiment. Now that they're in an advantageous position, they seem to be reeling in and waiting for moments to shine when it's the, the PlayStation exclusive experience. So, I don't know. Yeah, I guess well, it's whether or not you subscribe to conference mentality. Well, I, I, I was realize talk how dusty this monitor was. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> now, let us let me just get this out of the way. I was 100% wrong on Sony uh, revealing a PS5. Let's just put that behind us. But there is a possibility that they could have a future uh, development where they do tease a future PlayStation console. Would it be wise for them to have done it at E3 or maybe later on in the year? What if they do decide to tease something at the end of PSX? All that hype, all that excitement is going to go right back to PlayStation. It's not checkers, man. It's chess. Sometimes it Vita doesn't appear two. right. Vita 2. God damn it, Gary. Talking about sequels, Beyond Good and Evil 2 had a tech demo gameplay reveal um, and has also had a tweet which was since deleted by Ubisoft Spain confirming that the game will be coming to PC, PS4, Xbox One and wait for it, Nintendo Switch. Damn, the gameplay really? looked fantastic. It looked like one of the best looking games I've ever seen so I don't know how the hell it's ever going to go onto the Switch. But did you guys see that tech demo? I did. I did. I did. I did. Yeah. With the monkey flying, yeah, it was unbelievable. I've got to fly that monkey. I don't know what he's doing or where he's going, but I'm, I'm going to fly him. God damn it. It's going to happen. Next headline, Destiny 1 is dead. Long live Destiny 2. I think it's finally <laughs> fair to say Destiny is dead. You know, in, in October, you can turn back and say you still play that dead game. It's, it's officially happening. Right, yeah. <laughs> Gone. In the TWAB post this week at Bungie this week, uh, Deej community managers outlined plans for the end of life of Destiny 1. These oh. include emblems and as of yet unreleased tokens of recognition for players who have played the first game. So there's a series of different um, emblems that you can be awarded. And uh, Bri, if you want to elaborate, we can. But the main news story here is that Bungie have outlined that events that will continue in the first game may not be the fan favourites of Iron Banner and Trial of, Trials of Osiris, which will actually have a last date, I believe, to be August 11th for Trials and even earlier for Banner. So staples of Destiny 1 will not be playable moving forward in September. What do Ooh, we think about this? that sucks. Yeah, I don't, I don't like... They that did sucks. this with the Xbox 360 and the PS3 as well. Mm -hmm. When they got left behind at Rise of Iron, they took away some of the activities that were previously available and paid for by the players absolutely uh so yeah i don't really dig on this i mean sure most people are going to move on to destiny 2 so it's not it's probably not going to affect too many people but not everybody's going to move on to destiny 2 some people are going to have to wait till christmas or birthday to mm -hmm. get destiny 2 and they already have destiny 1 and they want to keep playing with their friends you know trials of osiris and iron banner and nightfalls and 
Bungie taking that stuff away, I don't know. It struck me as kind of shitty when they did it to the 360 and PS3 players, and now they're doing it to all Destiny 1 players, and it still strikes me as shitty. That, yeah, well, uh, 100% side, agree with you. They're taking away Iron Banner and uh, Trials in August, but they're giving back with the uh, PlayStation exclusives in October. So, you know, the Lord taketh and the Lord giveth back. So it's, it's all good, you know. It's yeah, I know, I know Xbox on. players are very relieved to finally get those exclusives after two years. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say jumping for joy, but I feel like that's the sentiment I've been reading on Reddit and Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can finally take their uh, their Jade Rabbit into trials. Oh, oh no, no, they they can't. Oh wait, yeah, no, yeah, no. Or well, I, they can't. oh no, uh, not Iron. That's so either. fucked up. It's all good. They can visit Zer it. every week, though. They can visit Zer, so that's that's something. Yeah, Zer um, will stick around. This next news article actually made me a little bit angry, um, and you know I've, I've never been a, an internet warrior, but I feel like we should uh, we should all be concerned about the business practices here. Konami assholery ascends to new heights as they oh, move to really? they're getting employees. Worse? Following the uh, Kojima Konami split, more news has leaked, which certainly does not paint Konami as employer of the year. The Nikkei Asian Review reports this is this is factual that Konami has been issuing formal. Like, written complaints to any company that hires any of their former fired employees who are loyal to Kojima. In the note, Konami refers to the former employees as ex-cons of the business who were forbidden to put Konami experience on their public resumes and are recommended to not be employed by any other Japanese organization. These motherfuckers, man, excuse my language, they're blacklisting people. Konami has to be the most vindictive and petty video game publisher I've ever known of in my entire life. Konami it, are the type of company that would chop your dick off and throw it from a moving vehicle. Like, that is the, the type of company. Lorena Bobbitt. Have. Lorena Bobbitt. And see, I've said this in the past, Gary. They remind me of a, a spiteful and vindictive ex. The one that you'll see in your Twitter feed, or the, the one that you'll see in your Facebook posts, dissing you every chance they get. A person that comes to your house at 2 in the morning, beats on your front door, you come to the door and say, I left some socks under your fucking table. That is Konami. My At God. what point do we as gamers basically just boycott Konami? Like, like, at what point do we just say, you know what, it doesn't matter if you do another Castlevania or another Metal Gear Salad, we're not buying it because you're shitheads and we don't want to support you. Yeah, I, I agree with you, bro. There's only one thing they could do that could like make me rescind that temporarily is like if they remastered Symphony of the Night. If they did that, I would have to say, I fucking hate you. But you used a cheat code this one time? So basically, you have <laughs> no conviction. <laughs> it's it's, I mean, of the it's, night, it's <laughs> a serious asshole move to yeah. not just go after Kojima. I completely understand that they've got a grudge with him and for right or wrong reasons. But any affiliated employees who they deemed as loyal to Kojima who left after the split are now being oh. targeted. He and for any future endeavors... They called them ex-cons who are forbidden to put Konami experience on their resumes because they would deny all knowledge of those individuals. You have to think, guys, that there's no one in a position of management or upper management at Konami that is vetting these decisions. It's like uh, they've got priests, like people in middle school making these executive decisions that are going out to the public sphere and making this company look more and more like shit every year. Unbelievable. Mm -mm -mm. Interesting story. Uh, from one bad publicity move to another gta 5 may have finally killed mods publisher take two this week has shut down several popular mods open four which was the the big one uh, which let people make like you know tron maps and sky maps and all sorts of crazy interesting things um has been given a cease and desist and shut down which has prompted fans of i guess gta online to take to review bombing anything made by or published by take two or rockstar en masse um, it was actually Rockstar have supported Take Two's decision by saying it was done to prevent cheaters in GTA Online, uh, but this really wasn't the case because Open Four created numerous of the top ten single player mods, uh, including Electronic Arena. So, what do we think? Uh, why have they, you know, gone to kill this mod creation tool when previously Rockstar and Take Two have been touting it as an expression of creativity in the community when they were trying to drive sales for GTA Online. GTA 6 is on its way. We want to make sure people are ready for it. We want to make sure that, oh, we're gonna, you know, all these people playing GTA 5, they've got all this new content. We're making all this new content for GTA 6. Come on over to the new game. You don't want to play that old shit. 
it's been how many years since GTA Five? Uh, I want to say 20, 2013 is when it came out. Yeah, so we're probably right on the cusp of, of GTA Six. That's probably a, a, a probably the perfect uh, reason for this to happen, Briar. No, I think I haven't played the game in so long. You know, I had no idea all this stuff was still going on with Grand Theft Auto Five. I mean, as far as I'm understanding it, obviously 2013, I believe, was the the PS3 um, Xbox yeah. 360 version, but the PC version's not been out for a huge amount of time. And GTA yeah, well, Online like a year is, later, right? Or was it six I think months couple later? Of, couple of years later or something. A couple. Because I thought it got ported to the PS4 um, and Xbox One, and then the PC version came out subsequent to that. Yeah, Maybe 2015 ish. Yeah. But GTA Online's really found legs. You know, things like um, I, I saw King Gathelian playing uh, GTA Roleplay, which is like a huge sub-genre that's happened now where people create these servers and then agree to roleplay certain... T- it's huge. I mean, GTA Online still continues to grow and grow and grow. And the fact that they're killing these modding tools that allow that sort of creativity is, is really a slap to the face of the community. So, yeah, maybe not not the wisest move. We'll see what happens with that. But uh, see if you guys are right with GTA do, 6. Do you do you think it's possible that GTA 6 could be on the horizon, Gary? Possibly. I mean, I it's mean, been it's been a number of years now. I would have thought Rockstar are pushing all their resources towards Red Dead Redemption Red Dead at the too. moment, but I could be wrong. Um, talking about things that will be in short supply, uh, we may not get sequels for GTA, and we're certainly not getting much Switch stock. Uh, financial analyst Daniel Ahmad has shared that the NAND, NAND memory, I guess, chip, is being monopolized by Apple, Apple in the production of iPhone 8s. So if anyone cannot get their Switch through 2017 and is going to have to wait till the 2018 shortage season ends, please send angry letters to Apple because they are responsible for you not having a <laughs> Switch directly uh, and tell them that the Beastly Thoughts crew said so. In well, unrelated everyone- news, the price of headphone jackets has plummeted as apparently there's plenty of headphone jacks to go around. <laughs> They're just bountiful and plentiful, uh, unlike unlike uh, Nan Flash. The Nan, Nan memory, okay. <laughs> Bri- Briar has Apple on his speed dial. He can call him. He has every Apple product. I That's actually not true. Got- to be honest with you, BC, I've, I've really been falling out of out of my love affair with Apple over the last couple of years. They don't make computers that really work for me anymore. Uh, I've bought, you know, I've got, I went ahead and bought a Windows 10 PC to, for streaming and for gaming. Um, I've do you, do frankly you use got another things? one coming soon. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they lost the iPhone you. is really the last thing I, I'm using on a regular basis. I use the iPad a little bit to read magazines and stuff, but. I still use my Mac for editing video because Final Cut Pro so X fast. is amazing. God, it's fast. So, Executive VP of EA, Patrick Soderman, has made a crazy outlandish claim that I've never heard anyone make about any video game series ever. Um, he claimed that Anthem will be a 10-year journey, uh, being yeah. touting Microsoft as the premier partner for the franchise on that yeah. journey. <laughs> I mean, who would be <laughs> crazy and stupid enough to say any game could be a 10-year journey? Really? Ridiculous. <laughs> Dude, Ridiculous. All, all they got to do is just plot the same course that Destiny did, right? It's, all they got to do is just say oh, all the same shit. shit that Destiny was saying mm. and before release, but then actually <laughs> deliver a full game. <laughs> and they'll just be like, the no. world will just be open to them like a... Like an oyster. (laughs) If Anthem launched with a 12-month exclusive content for Microsoft, it would just be perfect. It couldn't be much better. Um, That's actually, I like this kind of stuff, is like to find out that, yeah, they do have a plan for a game, you know, moving forward. Sure, we've heard some bad stuff about like that kind of a thing. But to me, it like to start a franchise and have like a kind of multi-game story you know, kind of plot it out in, like, expansion, not expansions, but, like, an expansive world that, you know, we're, we'll get to explore over time. That's actually really exciting to me, as opposed to, you know, we made, we made a game, it was really popular, you know, Bio how do we make coming. a sequel to it, like a Bioshock 2 kind of thing, right, where it's, yeah. it, I don't know, it just, it seems smarter, you know, like, it, you look at, like, uh, the Marvel Universe right now, where they planned out this, like, multi-year, multi-movie mm-hmm you know, plot line and you know, if done well, that stuff could be really cohesive and really fun. If done shitty, you know, Easy. it could fall apart. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
To me, it's like a, a long-term investment, Briar. You know, I didn't get into Destiny the same way you did, but there are lots of people who did and who play games like The Division, Only which, the of course, is a failure. Did. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a long, drawn-out kind of experience, and a lot of people enjoy that. It's like watching your own soap opera, but it's one that you can play. It's something new. They're constantly introducing new aspects of the game, new materials into the game, new storylines and plot twists. To a lot of gamers, man, that's kind of the dream. It's it's old school was like the soap operas. Now it's Destiny. I mean, Destiny's got a plan. Anthem's got a plan. Division had a plan. I mean, shit, OJ had a plan, but he's in a white full Bronco he, gunning it down. Did, the did he have you know, a that, plan? <laughs> I think that that man's actions mark an individual that did not have a plan. He didn't have no <laughs> plan. The glove does not fit. You must acquit. Must acquit. <laughs> Um, to no one's surprise, COD oh, 4 shit. Modern Warfare has got a standalone release, physical and digital release on June 27th for PS4 and Xbox One has been confirmed at $40, $40. Not, <laughs> not including any of the additional map packs or DLCs, which what? will be sold <laughs> separately. Even... Oh my God. Is this price too high? What do we think? Should it have included the DLC? And does this damage the goodwill that the COD brand has been getting from World War II? I'm not buying it. I mean, it should be a it should be a twenty twenty four ninety nine dollar game, forty dollars plus an additional twenty dollars for map packs. Yeah, so if, they had, if they had added in the map packs, forty dollars seems reasonable to me. Yeah, but forty dollars a little high though. Honestly, I mean, it's a remaster. It's a almost a year old remaster of a ten year old game. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's still a little high. <laughs> With map Still packs that were in the original game, yeah. I, I feel like it should be a Game of the Year edition, like you say, that comes with all the DLC wrapped up nicely in a bow uh, if you didn't want to buy Infinite Warfare. But, yeah, I don't know. It, it feels to me, like, like I said, this could be damaging the COD brand because they're riding high on this World War II news. Everything's been positive about COD so far. You know, since the debacle of Infinite Warfare uh, and the reveal of World War II, people have said good things. And this is probably the first news story that's going to be negative about COD. So we'll see where that one goes. Um, the other news story is, is um, a bit out of the blue. Did you guys see Sega launches Sega Forever or Sega yeah, Forever? I'm for the playing Earth? it. Yeah, what free collection no, of retro games it. on I've mobile phones. It's awesome. So what Sega are doing is they're releasing games free of charge, classic games on their mobile phones, which will have full controller support and cloud saves. The first five include Altered Beast, Kid Chameleon and Sonic the Hedgehog. The catch here is that the you know the games are completely free but ad supported. If you want to make a one dollar ninety nine one off purchase, you can play them infinitely. All of the new games that are added completely ad free. That's, That's dope awesome, as man. shit, man. That's amazing. I've, Altered yeah. Beast, baby. I've been going off in Altered Beast. Yeah. Oh man, I haven't played it's, that since I had it on Genesis, man. Yeah, it's it, it's it's like the arcade perfect version of the game. Oh, it's the arcade just, version. No, it's a Sega Genesis version, oh. I believe. But it's still, it's awesome, man. I've been playing that one. And uh, you get ads after every level, so it's really not a, a real issue. You're going to pony up the two bucks? No, I ain't paying for that <laughs> shit. I got a Sega Genesis. But... You're a real gamer. A real gamer supporting hey, man. the community and developers. Don't, don't you diss me. I got five kids. I got college to pay for shit. But And that $2 when... is paying for... All of them to go to college right there. Hey, man, who knows how much college courses are going to cost in the future, Gary? Now, let me just say this, though. Uh, the, the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons can actually work with this thing as well. So you can use those as Bluetooth controllers for your phones. Really? They, they, yeah, they just came out with an article. That. Yeah, and a lot of people are using it. It's called the perfect marriage between Nintendo and Sega. So you can use those to play these old school Sega Genesis games from your phone. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, any Bluetooth controller um, can be supported on it. So you can actually use a PS4 DualShock 4 um, to play them as well, providing it syncs with your phone. Dude, this, this to me is more interesting than the Switch going to traveling. <laughs> 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 because, like, I've played Zelda, right? And I don't have another game right now for Switch that I want to play. I'm use hoping Switch. that the virtual console, like, comes out, so I, or whatever that new Nintendo thing is going to be that, you know, you can play older games. But I'm I'm going to Guardian Con this week, and I'm thinking, man, Sega I can forever. Just bring a PlayStation Sega forever, Four man. and play some Sega games on the plane. So, for anyone that's looking forward to the Guardian Con podcast of the DCP, Brian will not be attending because he's going to be completing Kid Chameleon. <laughs> Perfect. Downloading it right now. <laughs> so, more 
news that's going to pique Briar's. I pretty much put the news together and then think, what could Briar be interested in? And this next story is one of his. Randy Pitchford, CEO of Gearbox, has offered to publish Hitman. IO Interactive are no longer the nomadic wanderers. Pitchford tweeted a congratulatory tweet to the developer saying, please reach out when you need publishing support and want a private, not publicly traded partner. This was both in support of the studio and a slight at investor-centric practices of publishers such as Square Enix, EA or Activision. So Gearbox being a public, um, sorry, a private company, not a publicly traded company, can obviously give IO the creative freedom they need to and not push them with you know, sales deadlines and and you know the same sort of deadlines uh, that you need with a PLC. So I, we may I'm see happy for Gearbox. IO. Like things really seem to be going their way. They made an awesome game with Hitman, and it seems like while that didn't it didn't pay off while they were a Square, it seems like it's actually paying off long term. Is that they are gonna actually get out of a contract that maybe was a little harsh <laughs> with Square, and they're keeping their IP, and they've got interested uh interested parties willing to work with them that's great news i like to see i'd like to see people's hard work be rewarded it just makes me feel good they might not have worked very hard right they might have just been exceptionally talented people they might have been half arsing it and doing half days and (laughs) pulled that out we don't know (laughs) working 10 hour work weeks and just making magic (laughs) making magic happen (laughs) they they subcontracted out to like chinese developers that's it they did nothing (laughs) you guys ever hear about that guy he worked for an it company in silicon valley and he he basically uh subcontracted some subcontracted out his own job to a guy in india and paid him a quarter of what he got paid to do the job in America and got caught. Damn. Yeah. That would have been a good couple of years before you got caught, though, wasn't it? You know, I, just... I don't know how long it was, but guess where his job went. <laughs> yeah. You just proved I that you are if... useless. <laughs> I wonder if they brought the Indian guy to Silicon Valley or just kept him out there and, you know, just continue paying him a quarter of what they were paying the other guy. I Fantastic. Know. I don't know. Capitalism at work. Damn. Um, I'd like us to all get our world's smallest violins ready here because we're going to hear the, the the cries of ponies everywhere universally um, as we make this announcement. It looks like Battlegrounds is going to be a brand exclusive on the Xbox family and Windows PC. The Express has reported that they have confirmation from Bluehole that the game will not be coming to PS4 at this time despite confusing labelling at the E3 conference. Um, Ponies Everywhere did get a slight ray of hope from a further statement that Blue Hole made where they stated, we are always looking at various platforms to potentially introduce our game, but have no further plans at this moment. Battlegrounds has shifted 4 million copies since entering early access three months ago and will be hitting Xbox Game Preview later this year with a full release 2018. What do we think about this? Fucking awesome, man. Xbox needs games like this that will drive people out there to buy. I mean, this is a big deal for me. I love uh, uh, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. I suck on PC, so finally I get an opportunity to play it in my native land, the console space. And there's probably a lot of people who feel that way. And uh, I think that if it was coming to PlayStation, it'd be an easy win for, for Sony, even if it came out a little bit later. The fact this is sticking with Xbox is more of a reason for people to say, oh, I need to have the Xbox One, I need the Xbox One X or the Xbox One S because PUBG's coming to it. It's a you huge said- gift. You said you play it on your native land. You did hear the announcement this wasn't coming to Sony. This oh, is damn. Microsoft. <laughs> My bad, man. My bad. Hey, Gary, yeah, I, does the Zim 4 work with Xbox One? It works on everything. It actually works on PC as well, strangely enough. I know. I know. That's, that's like Inception <laughs> level shit. People were actually going to be using it to cheat in Destiny later this year. Um, you can actually plug a controller into the PC and get aim assist. Uh, and then you can plug a Zim into that controller and use a keyboard and mouse anyway to get aim assist, but with native mouse and keyboard input. It's great. They did it in Overwatch to cheat in the beta. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens later. But yeah, no, uh, Zim 4 works on pretty is much. Something, is that something you highly recommend, Briar? No. <laughs> oh, wow. <okay. laughs> I, I'll cheat on any platform you can offer me. It's fine. I have no qualms whatsoever. Sweet wins. Sweet wins. Talking about sweet wins, Zenimax uh, weren't content with winning $500 million in damages from Oculus. They are oh. now going for a punch right in the dick. They are asking for 20% of the company's profits for the next 10 years or blocking the sales of the HMD. They have also seek to increase their damages from $500 million to a cool one bill. 
Legal experts in corporate law are urging ZeniMax and Oculus to settle and focus on re-establishing working relationships for the benefit of all customers, employees and shareholders. Why can't these two companies stop fighting each other? What do we think? Well, I think they can't stop fighting each other because one of them had their, their uh, IP stolen, their, their data stolen. It was used by a competitor. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of truth to that. We see what happened uh, to Palmer Lucky. You know, this guy was known for, I guess, being kind of shady in that environment. And uh, from what I understand, at least, he took a lot of data. Guy sounds like he's got a name as like, like a 1800s poker player, like a cheap <laughs> poker player. <doesn't> he? <laughs> Palmer <Totally>. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the simple fact is, Zenimax feels like they were they were done wrong, and obviously, there's a lot of people who agree with them. They won 500 million. They're like, okay, this is a pretty clear case. We won this much money. Let's either take 20% of the profits from the sales or get a billion dollars. And if I was on their, both. They're they going both. for both? Fuck. Yeah. That's hardcore, yeah, they're really, man. They're going hard. That's hardcore. Um, I mean, the reason that this is an interesting point is that ZeniMax, um, through Bethesda, are, are actually doing a lot of um, uh, VR games. Yeah. And things like uh, Skyrim, won't be coming to oculus at the moment as far as we know things that really should be fallout will have to be played via a third-party mod to make it work on the oculus and these are things that again the consumers are the ones that are missing out the customers are missing out here not anyone else so legal experts are saying you know why can't you guys just settle and get this case done and move on yeah i mean i understand that perspective you know uh, the consumer it'd be nice if we could all you know have access to everything but in the midst of a bitter bitter war between two gaming giants, you know they've got to they got to hash it out. And if they're not willing to meet at the table and, and come up with a plan where they can, you know, do something behind closed doors, they've got to go through the system. And and, and this shit is going to get rough from the sounds of it. it. Sounds like it's already really bad, but it, it sounds like it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better to me. The last lawsuit didn't reflect kindly on Oculus or no. John Carmack or Palmer Lucky. I mean, it didn't. You know, John Carmack came out and tried to defend himself, but it, you know, it sounded like he had stolen data, right? Yeah, it sounded like it he had walked like. with data and then used it for Oculus. Oculus. And, you know, if at some point, Facebook's got to say, you know, we really think this is going to be the future, but you guys really fucked this shit up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe it's time to cut this whole Oculus brand and see, see what else is going on around the industry because. How much is Facebook going to pour into this in just lawsuit shit, you know? Like, never mind yeah. the R&D and the development and the... Man, you got is it, is it... Do you guys think that at some point in time, Zenimax is going to come out with an Oculus-style device? No. I just think this is a, an, an easy way for them to capitalize the business. I don't think they're interested in making a vr platform themselves i think it was the software that would work with the hardware that that is in question this sounds more to me this sounds less about like patent trolling and trying to make a dime than it does i fucking hate these guys and i want to kill them yeah it, honestly if I <laughs> like i want one bill i don't want to take their money i want to take their their life their everything i want that to crush these guys that's what it sounds yeah. like to me jeez We'll see what happens with it. I mean, it was only one Texas court that settled the original 500 million. There were multiple other courts that were, you know, in deliberation on it. Mm -hmm. um, they had several different cases going, and some of them they wanted like three billion up front. Um, <sighs> you know, it, it was this Damn. particular case that that landed. Um, I mean, let's be fair. Oculus have not paid a cent of that 500 mm -hmm. million yet. It's still in, you know, contested. Like I said, though, uh, even say. when John Carmack, you know, wrote that open letter to defend himself. Like he admitted to having taken data. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think it's the question here, um, without getting too deep on, on the corporate law, is if you leave a company and you worked on something and you developed that technology, at what point is it Yours fair? or the company's. Yeah, at what point is it your intellectual property? Uh, if you, you know, lift and shift, fine. But if you take what you've learned and deploy it into a, into a competitor's tool, then I guess, is that all right? I mean, I know from my industry financial services sector if i have knowledge from one bank and i leave and take that knowledge and help them build a product at another bank that's just fair business whether or not it's expertise that i've learned at one place that's because yeah, banking how the is, business works because banking is shady as fuck but when you look at the, the video game industry 
Beastly, Look you at make what a strong happened. point here. <laughs> yeah. um, Hideo Kojima was the, the brainchild, the creator of, of the modern Metal Gear series. What happened there? He was the one who crafted that game from start to finish. He left Konami and he can't do anything with it. I mean, and he's the one who made the game. So I, I think that Carmack and, and Lucky really screwed the pooch and did some shit they weren't supposed to do. We'll see where this settles. Do you think it's time for us to stop arguing about VR and start arguing about the price of games? What do you think? Prices! Prices! <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've got a good round table here for you guys. It's looking at why do games still cost $60? One of these days, we will get a voting system for people in chat uh, so that you guys can decide who won. Hopefully, we'll come in the future, but uh, we're not going to make any more promises. You guys can just leave uh, comments in the chat and we will uh, gleefully ignore them. So <laughs> let's kick off with uh, a nice intro. So. <laughs> no, I'm going to look at the chat. You guys hit us up in the chat. I will be monitoring Beastly, the chat. our man but... on the scene, our man in the I'm chat. Here. I'm here. <laughs> BC Gamer, he's watching it like a hulk. All right. I didn't um, think you know how to find my channel on Twitch, so I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Gary sent me a link. <laughs> if you click subscribe, Brian gives you $5 a month just to let you know. Um, <laughs> I clicked it 10 perfect. times. So let's set the scene here. Why do games still cost $60? Publishers have set this as the market price since the launch of the PS3, Xbox 360 generation almost 12 years ago, way back in 2005, which I think Robbie was born around then, actually, somewhere near there. Adjusting for inflation, the real cost of games should have increased by about 41%, bringing the sticker price on a game to $85. So where is that extra $25 being made up? The answer, the dreaded season pass DLC and microtransaction. The first modern season pass was introduced in 2011 by Rockstar Games under the title of L.A. Noir that offered a $10 discounted pass to get four exclusive post-launch missions. This opened the floodgates developers who quickly realised they could double the game's sticker price on release day so there was the promise that was there of drip-fed content some point down the line. Now season passes are now commonplace amongst AAA releases with the average season pass costing $40 and microtransactions adding even more icing on the proverbial cake. A study by marketing firm Sferv found that in 2016, the average amount spent per gamer on microtransactions in a given game was 24.33, bringing the total cost fully loaded of a game in 2017 to $125. As the developers shift to games as a service, offering the bulk of their content as purchasable DLC in post sales phase, coupled with more intrusive microtransactions, do we as a group feel that developers have made the right move in keeping the initial purchase price low and backloading post sales charges or would we be happier to pay a large chunk of change up front knowing that our wallets remain untapped in the future i think they've made the right move um i actually don't have a problem with this at all i'm not a huge fan of the season pass i'm not a huge fan of the pre-order stuff Agreed. Um, but the fact that games are still sixty dollars, and you know, you quote the PS3 and Xbox 360, but I remember games for the PS2 and the Xbox being sixty dollars as well. Some games were fifty dollars, some games were sixty dollars, depending on where they came from. And even going back as far as uh, the Sega Genesis, I remember paying eighty dollars. Super for, Nintendo. Was yeah, I remember paying eighty dollars for a cartridge. Um, so in some respects, the games are actually cheaper than they used to be because when they moved to CDs and DVDs, it got a lot much cheaper to manufacture. But the actual development cost has gone up. Yeah. Because now you have 3D worlds that need to be fully fleshed out and you got multiple artists, you know, working on 4K 4K textures and assets. You know, the the models have to be so much more detailed because the the consoles and the P PCs are so much more powerful. It's hugely time intensive and labor intensive to make these things and the games have to be broader in scope so you have to have you know programmers just making like these huge you know complex open worlds so the cost is going up to develop it so how you know what do we do do you set do you have, are you forced to sell 10 million copies to make your money back or do you try and Get a little bit of extra money off of the people who really enjoyed what you did. And that's where microtransactions and DLCs and season passes come in. And while I don't like when 
you know, these things can you know, break the balance of a game mm -hmm. and force people to force people to pay extra to stay competitive. I don't mind throwing a few bucks Destiny's way to buy a, an emo or you know a, a shader or you know if I'm playing Horizon if and I really enjoyed it I don't mind paying a little extra get a DLC and I you know I think it's all fair because this stuff costs so much more than it used to to develop they've got to figure out a way to pay for it. Briar, wow, I couldn't have said that any better. I 100% I agree with virtually everything you said there. For me, I remember back in the day where Super Nintendo games were $79. And I was a kid, and I had to wait for my mom or you know a relative to buy it or wait for Christmas, but the games were damn expensive uh, growing up. And for me, the $60 price point has been pretty standard for probably the last 20 years. You know, Dreamcast games were $60. Bucks. PlayStation 2 games were $60. PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and now PS4 games. But something that didn't exist in the past, like Briar alluded to, is the whole season pass and DLC. And to me, it makes perfect sense because if you play a game and you enjoy that game and that game world, something like Horizon Zero Dawn, I'm looking forward to the DLC. I really enjoy playing that game. And so for people who like particular games and they want to continue to support that developer, there's that option. And I think that it would be wrong to, in my own opinion, make a game 80 or $90 just off you know, I guess wanting to inflate the price to uh, recoup the cost for developers because a person might not like a game nearly as much. And so to me, it makes perfect sense to keep it at 60 rather than jump it up to 80 or $90 and give people the option to buy emotes and buy visual flourishes for a game uh, and support that developer that way. I want to also real quickly say uh, that in the comment section, our good friend Wilson has uh, left a link, guys, for you guys to click on the link and you can all vote today on what you think about the price of games, whether or not the prices are just right, they should cost more, they should cost cost less. So you guys start clicking on that now. Thanks, Wilson. Wilson's a fucking himself. man. It's actually not a straw poll at all. If you click it, there's multiple links and viruses. I, oh I my just, God, I just, there's so much porn here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, to be honest, I didn't know you could do those sorts of things with a donkey. I'm pretty impressed. I did. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so from my perspective, I guess it's less about should the sticker price be higher or lower, but is a sticker price still the right thing to do? So there's been experiments with games as a service before. So gaming is the only stalwart left in the industry that we are uncomfortable about paying a service model for. So every single gaming streaming service, even ones that are technically functional, so GeForce Now is a great service, it, you know, streams with almost no latency, but people are uncomfortable to pay monthly for games. So Netflix, you think nothing about Hulu, you know, you'll pay for it, Crunchyroll, pay for it, Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, all of these are services that people would not think about buying a CD, you know, uh, uh, digitally. You, know, you wouldn't buy an album on iTunes when you could just stream it. Why would you? I'd pay $10 a month and I'd have as much as I want to consume. Would we be comfortable shifting to a model whereby we purchased something like EA Access, let's say, or EA Origin or whatever it wants to be, whereby you could subscribe to a developer and get their catalogue moving forward for as long as you wanted to do it, if you if you had a subscription for that particular developer that you were a fan of? I'll tell you what the problem that, is, Gary. That would be a bad I wouldn't idea. do this. I would hate this because what you're describing isn't getting a Netflix or a Hulu. It's getting an individual subscription Developers. to... CBS, ABC, uh, History Channel, like every single fucking one of them. And all of a sudden, you got all these little money leeches on you. And before you know <laughs> it, you're spending $150 a month on, you know, what you used to get for 100 bucks a month when you hit cable. You know, I, I, I wouldn't mind, like, if the platforms did it, mm -hmm. like PlayStation did PlayStation it, or, or Xbox. Xbox did it, but... When individual developers or publishers start doing it, I'm not fucking interested because there's just too many of them, and I want to be able to play games from all sor sorts of them. And, and another real issue uh, with having a developer that you pay a monthly or annual fee for is that developers don't make games every month. You know, if you're paying for a game, if you're paying for a subscription for a game, developers take time to release games. Now, if you're talking about an indie developer who can get a game out to you every three or four months, that will be worth it. But most developers release one game a year, if that. So what are you okay. paying for? 
what about then if we we work on this idea? I'm just trying to find something that's uh you know an alternative. I see your wheels changes, turning, changes Barry. The I see world. your wheels turning. You mentioned Briar about um, you know Comcast cable and you know satellite packages. What about if Sony or Microsoft could sign deals for certain genres of games? So you say I'm a sports fan. I'm gonna get the sports package. Every sports game that comes out, I'm gonna be getting monthly. You know, I buy a 12 month subscription to sports games. I'm so, still not yeah, interested because I play out. Madden, and if I can play, I, may, I play Madden all year round. That's my game. I don't play FIFA. I don't play MLB. I don't play hockey because those aren't my games. I play Madden. I can buy Madden for sixty dollars, or I could pay ten dollars a month for a year and pay one hundred twenty dollars for Madden. I, I think it works best. This model would work in cer certain regards, like if Nintendo did it. Then I could see it working. If Nintendo decided to charge fifteen dollars a month and you get access to, you know, the virtual console catalog, I could see it working. But I don't think there's that many people that could do it and do it right oh. or make it a value. Okay. So why is it that you're comfortable doing that with media, but you're not comfortable doing that with games media? Because it can't. It has a cost for me, but it also came at the benefit of saving me a shit ton of money where I used to have a hundred dollar it was a hundred twenty dollar cable bill per month uh ouch I cut the cord right and now I I pay actually I cut Hulu out too so now I only have Netflix and I have Amazon yeah. Prime and then anything I want to supplement I buy piecemeal if I want to watch um if I want to watch let's say The Walking Dead I either buy the full season or I buy it per episode until I realize this season's going to suck just as bad as the last one, and I stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> but what 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 was happening to me is that I was paying all this money and I wasn't actually watching any content. So hmm. being able to just piecemeal pick it out, like if I want to watch Breaking Dead, Breaking Bad, it's on Netflix. I could pay fifteen dollars a month and have hundreds of thousands of hours of content, or I could pay a hundred or $100 a month and watch Breaking Bad, you know, when it's on. And to me, the value proposition was, is so much simpler to just have Netflix. But the, I don't, I don't see these guys offering that value proposition. Nef uh, Nintendo could, but I don't, you know, I don't see. Xbox the other games, problem is they also passes. make less money on this stuff. Right, mm -hmm. you talk to no. you talk to the people who make music. You talk to you know any anybody in a band. They make less money than they used to make in the '90s when everybody bought CDs. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. The movie industry makes less money. The TV industry makes less money. So I don't know that this is actually in the game industry's best interest either. Maybe for older yeah, stuff. But I mean, like if you have back catalog yeah, games, absolutely. Maybe, but if you put for the sure. newest stuff, Brian, I just don't example. know how sustainable this is. Uh, sorry, uh, BC, but I'm just no, sort of so why we're suggesting other things is that at the moment you're happy to pay a sixty dollars sticker price, but as development costs increase exponentially with games, there's going to come to a point where the DLC and the season pass is going to be two and three times the price of the game, and that happened with Fire Emblem recently. That the game was forty dollars and the season pass was I think sixty five or seventy dollars. And people went crazy. They're like, oh, my God, Like, why are you charging me so much? But the content was so heavily weighted. You know, they, they created almost an entire game again in Season Pass. So what are you going to do? If you keep the sticker price at 60, you're just going to have to keep making that Season Pass more and more expensive. And it raised the price. I mean, if you look at the value proposition you get from the average video game, let's say you put, I don't know, what the, what's the average hours for a video game? I mean, some are as little as six hours. Some you put th a thousand, two thousand hours into. But let's say, let's say you got a hundred hours of enjoyment out of a video game, and you charge a hundred dollars for that video game. That's a dollar a minute. How much? Or dollar an hour? How much? You know, how much are you paying for a movie? Mm -hmm. If you go to the movie theater, you pay what thirteen dollars for yeah. two hours. For two hours, so that's six dollars an hour, right? Six fifty an hour. So it's actually. Even at $100, you're still getting a value with that video game. I think, you know, if, if they need to, I want to keep playing video games, and I want people who make video games to be successful in life because they, they do a great job. So if they need to raise the prices, what can raise the prices? And the, the, same way that, the same way that prices are lower, Briar. I mean, certain developers release games like Friday the 13th. It wasn't a complete package. The developer felt that way, 
it came out at 40 bucks mm -hmm. rather than $60. It doesn't have to be ubiquitous across the board. I think $60 is just a standard that everybody's used to that very few people raise question about. We've been doing it for years. Somebody's going to have to do be the first one to bite that bullet. And they're going to yeah, get a world it's gonna get, fucking They're going to get fucked. They're <laughs> yeah, gonna they get are, fucked. man. Nobody wants to be that first guy. Yes. <laughs> Nintendo have already <laughs> looked at doing that, at least in the UK. Um, a lot of the Switch games... In the UK, a lot of the Switch games are launching at £60, which is, what, $75, $80? Wow. So, you know, at least for us in the UK, we've already seen that uh, that jump. One more um, area that, that I guess want to hit on this before we consult... Wilson straw poll uh, and share with our listeners who won this debate. The other point, I guess, that you raise, bro, is around time and, and time reward on play. What about if it was like a, a pay per hour kind of basis? So you could either buy the game outright or to support the developer, you could say, I don't know if I'm going to like this game, but I'll give you $10 for two hours play. And then if I buy the rest of the game, that's that's refunded onto it. But there's, you know, there's no additional costs there. I'm just trying to give different ways to monetize this. Would you think that there could be a way to almost demo a game, but a paid for demo? I don't like that idea because I, I don't, I don't feel good about paying for a beta. Although yeah. I'm, I'm paying for early access in PUBG and having the time of my goddamn life. <laughs> <laughs> it could work, bro. I don't know. Saying. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm. I'm super sensitive. I'm, I'm more sensitive to it right now, too. You caught me on a funny day because I was just literally having a conversation about all of these little money leeches that we got sucked onto us that I want to start ripping <laughs> off. It's, but, see, the, the thing is, right, entertainment, the cost of entertainment shouldn't be ubiquitous across across different forms of entertainment because you can listen to a whole album and it might take you an hour, but you're still going to pay $15 for the album, right? Yeah, but a you movie's, listen to it multiple times, right? Yeah. A movie is going to be two hours. Like <laughs> a book might take you five days, right? It's still entertainment. It's just a different type of entertainment. I think that the standard that's been set and that's been met for the last few years is going to stick around for a while. The first person that does do this, like Brenner said, they're going to, you know, they're going to be at hell's gates when, when it comes to consumers. I think that only a handful of develop developers can actually do that and get away with it. Like uh, CD Projekt Red could possibly do it. People yeah. are so Grand Theft Auto, they could do it. Yeah, GTA, they could do yeah. it. Their games are so full right. of, of content and fully packed. But and and we know the pedigree. But if another developer just were to come out and say, "This is Ark Survival 2, ninety dollars," people would this, say, right? "Get the hell out of here." GameStop put up their sticker price, eighty dollars now on every game. But when you buy it, the cashier takes you around back and gives you a handy. How about now? Only if the cashier is a female. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, my it's local GameStop, big, not a sweaty great guy. ratio. Yeah, bro, are you being trouble? Yo, He's how about I give you an extra 20 and we skip the game shop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shit. That's, that's a, a great profitability. You know, that's it. GameStop just needs to hire big, sweaty guys with hairy knuckles to offer that deal. <laughs> yeah. Done. Oh, hairy knuckles? Oh, I'm back in. <laughs> <laughs> Brian said it looks just like my own. <laughs> There's nothing right. wrong here. Just like Mama used to make. <laughs> Mama did make it right. She did make. It. Now the straw poll um, has has closed now. So if you haven't cast your vote, then you've not only let us down, but you've let yourself down. Yeah. And the winning section with fifty eight percent of the votes is the cost is just right. So people seem to be comfortable with what we've got at the moment. Coming in second is they should cost more. And last place with 16% of the votes is they should cost less. So we have zero entitled snowflakes in our chat. Everyone seems to want to pay more or think that we're doing very well. So you should all be universally proud of yourselves for, for that Good result. Job. I think uh, we've settled it. So Phil, if you're watching, um, Briar hasn't forgotten that night. And, you know, you can now see that you can actually put your, your games up. You know, everyone's happy with them. Good stuff. What do we think? Do you think we should move on to some viewer questions? Before we move sure. on, I just want to thank Wilson. That was awesome. We really appreciate that, Wilson. Yeah. Love you, buddy. Let's go kill Wilson's people together. The, Wilson's the and man. PUBG. I think we... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we do without you in there. You're like a, an omnipresent person. Viewer questions. We're going to carry over four of them from last week because we didn't um, manage to, to answer them last time, and I felt like these guys had something that, that wanted to be said, so... We're going to kick off with, who wants to read them? Do you want to read them, Beasley? I think you've, you've got a sultry tone that I want to hear. Do it! Do it! 
<laughs> do it, do it. All right, let me get to it. <laughs> Viewer questions. First question is from James Byrne at Official K Burns. Assuming I have a new PC, i7-7700 GTX 1080 Ti, and I need a new monitor, what monitor should I would be best for Destiny 2 and why? Destiny 2? Yep. Oh, man. Game runs at 4K at 60 frames per second and looks fantastic. Depending on your budget, I'm putting a stretch goal out there of 4K. I'm putting a stretch goal out, out there of 4K, man. It looks stunning. So I'm going <laughs> to hard counter that. I'm going to do, a, a, I guess, a loop back to the head of the show when we uh, said that 60 hertz just isn't enough hertz. If you're a PC gamer with that spec It's there, the maximum is... the human eye can see, Gary. Yeah, I mean, if you've got glaucoma, <laughs> maybe. But, I mean, this is just <laughs> not, not what we want here. Um, GTX 1080 Ti, you're going to be pushing a hell of a lot of frames at 1440p. So, whilst the monitor that I recommended, the Asus at the start, any 1440p 144 hertz monitor that you think is a good value proposition for you would be the sweet spot for me you know if you're going into crucible if you're going to be wanting the smoothest experience try to get the 100 and a minimum 120 hertz monitor i think i think you got the right idea gary is look at your price your budget and hit the hit the look first criteria is 144 hertz second criteria g-sync third criteria ips Fourth criteria, resolution. That's what I'd be kind of moving in, in that direction. But I have played Destiny 2 in 4K at 60 frames per second. And Look at his smile. I'm not going to lie. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, it was literally, I've told this story before, but like everybody who walked around the corner and saw the monitors was like. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. It was like I mean universal. Everybody who walked around the corner, it was like this slack jaw, like, holy shit. In the perfect world, you'd have your 4K60 for the campaign and for strikes, and you'd have your 144 hertz, whatever, for PvP. But, you yeah. know, make your decision. Are you PvE or PvP? All right. Next question is by Trapstar Steven. Is it worth buying a gaming laptop, or should I just build a custom PC? I'm a console man, but looking to make the switch. Let me just say this. I have a gaming laptop. It was sold as that and marketed as that. It's still fairly decent, but it's not play worth PUBG it. If you, if you're, fine, right? Yeah, I can play PUBG, but I mean, and I can play like Rise of the Tomb Raider and stuff on it fine. But when it comes to the power that you have in the box, it's always going to be that. You know, as as technology moves forward and hardware moves forward, you're going to be left in the past. You won't be able to upgrade your your. Your, well, you can upgrade your RAM, but you can't upgrade your GPU, and certain aspects that are interchangeable on regular desktops just do not exist on most gaming laptops. So tread lightly and, and know that once you p purchase something, that's going to be what you have uh, for the life of that laptop. What do you guys think? I think go with the laptop if there's something that absolutely mandatory means you need to have a laptop. Are you going to college? You need to use this for taking notes in class? Gotta go with a laptop. It's just, you know, desktop's not gonna cut it. You wanna be able to bring your laptop to the library, you know, do work at the library. You wanna go to your friend's house and hook up the PCs and play together side by side. That's gonna be a pain in the nuts with a desktop and a monitor. But yeah. if your main goal is playing video games, if your main goal is to get the best PC for the least amount of money, desktop is without a doubt the way to go. And Fiddle around with the things may become a hobby for you. It may even become, you know, something you really enjoy. You know, doing overclocking, playing with the coolers, you know, buying water cooling, you know, switching out the monitors because you want, you know, maybe down the line you decide you want a 144 hertz monitor as opposed to a 60 hertz monitor. Switching out the graphics card when, you know, new stuff com becomes available. All that's possible on a desktop. It's not possible on a laptop. If there's a use case that requires you to have a laptop, get the laptop. If not, definitely go with a desktop. To me, a uh, gaming laptop is just one tiny tier above console peasant. So, it, you know, <laughs> it's up to you how you want to be seen. Do you want to have big swinging balls or do you want to have tiny little acorns? Hey, <laughs> motherfucker. 
I think we've addressed that question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I yeah, guess so. <laughs> the next question is from Steeler Ferdy at Steeler Ferdy. How big a deal is it Destiny 2 will not have beards for Guardians? That's Hashtag a fucking huge deal. Beards for Guardians. It's like the biggest. No Rumble. I can deal with it. Uh, what else has been taken out? No, no competitive playlists. Uh, all right. No fucking <laughs> beards. Are you <laughs> shitting me? You put the beards on the poster. You're advertised fucking beards. You put well, them on the poster, Bungie. You put them on the poster. When I, I saw that interview that, with Luke like, Smith awesome. where he said if they'd added beards, you'd have dropped to 15 frames per second. So Damn. is it worth it? That's dirty. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> beards. <laughs> okay, next question is from at Markly Berman 7. Since Bungie has changed all the subclasses in Destiny 2, what do you think will happen to the Taken King subclasses? Will they even return? DLC. In, I think in they're going to. Form of or another. Yeah. Yeah. It modified. Right. I mean, everything that we've gotten, some things are very different, but everything seems familiar right you know the sentinel still has a war to dawn bubble the dawn blade still has you know uh you know the, the ability to float in air you know the golden gun still shoots a golden gun you know it doesn't seem like they're straying too far from what we used to have in destiny one yeah. they're, they're keeping the themes but moving forward i think they'll probably continue to do so all right. Next question is from at Asrun Zuroff. With PUBG coming to the Xbox, what other PC games would you like to see migrate to consoles and why? I'm Sorry. not going to lie. I was reading chat. I, I missed the question. <laughs> with, <laughs> with PUBG coming to the Xbox, what other PC games would you like to see migrate to consoles and why? I'm not... A, I, I only know about PC games through word of mouth. I've never been a PC gamer. I know a lot of people are going to hate me for that. I've always been a console guy. So a lot of the stuff that's super big on PC, I really don't know about, and I apologize. So, from my Just perspective, I'd like to see more MMOs make the shift because Final Fantasy XIV has shown me that a cross-platform MMO can work. So games like World of Warcraft, you know, they're at a point now where the visuals on them could easily be handled by current-gen consoles with some Absolutely, concessions. Yeah. And there's such a wealth of content there. And I think console gamers are getting accustomed to the looter grind and playing a game that is just a grind-heavy game. So from my perspective, I know Black Desert Online is coming to Xbox. Don't know about PlayStation with, with that. But I'd like to see more MMOs make the transition. We're seeing survival games come over. So maybe that's the next Bl thing. Blade, Blade and Soul is an incredible MMO on PC. And that was one of the first ones I played when I bought this one. And graphically, it looks incredible. It looks like a PS4, Xbox One game. Uh, well, I know that's a downgrade, but it's a great MMO. I'd love to see that come to console. Briar? I want some of the VR jobs? stuff that I've played to come to console. I think some of that stuff is really phenomenal. Um, I'm sure. And I'd there love to is see one. It. What's that? The, the the VR game where you freeze in time and when Dude, you... It's right, coming to PlayStation. That's right. It's coming to PlayStation. Without a doubt, my favorite VR game ever. Like, Really? I, oh, my God. I love that game. It makes you feel... I don't know. It's just it's a very cool experience, and it's very well executed uh, on Steam and um, in the Oculus Store. It's a very cool game. So that, I'm really actually hy hyped that's coming to PSVR because that'll mean more people get a chance to play it. Um, but like stuff like Onward, where you know you got like a real yeah. a realistic first person shooter, and you're running around holding the gun in front of you. That stuff is fucking awesome. I'd like to I'd like to I want I want the Xbox to get a VR solution first of all. And I want the PSVR to start getting some of this real fun experimental stuff that we're seeing on Steam. Because mm. Steam is just, I mean, there's just tons of shit available for VR. A lot of it is really like small, tiny little experience that'd be hard to market on the PSVR. But at least there's experimentation. You get to play with it every once in a while. Awesome. Uh, the next question is actually two questions from at Hugo Rune 79. What is the worst game you've ever played? And what is the worst console D4. slash? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what is the worst console slash handheld you've ever owned? So Tiger Vita, Electronics you're Double Dragon. Immediately off the show. Uh, okay. Easy for me. 
this is absolutely very easy for me. The, uh, the worst game I've ever played, I've ever owned, was Superman 64. I know a lot of people have heard about this game in the past. You played that game? I bought, I bought that game when it came out. I'm a huge uh, Superman. I got a Superman tattoo. I mean, I, I'm, I was a huge fan of Superman. That game came out and it was based on the animated series, so I thought it was going to be awesome. And all you do is fly through rings the entire game, and it was just horrible. It controlled horrible. It felt horrible. And I still, in the back of my throat, feel throw up coming up because of how much I hated that game. The worst console slash handheld I've ever owned, the Atari Jaguar would be a close second. But I have to give this to Tiger for the Tiger Game Con. Uh, the Tiger Game Con was a handheld that, that showed gray, kind of black and white. And uh, it was kind of like the old school Tiger little handhelds you'd buy for like $10 at Walmart, but it had more power and actual cartridges. And I bought it because Resident Evil 2 came out on it. And never have you seen a <laughs> shittier game. And I had to, I played it for about 10 hours. And I think I got maybe about halfway through the game before I, I put it aside. And I have no idea what happened to my GameCon. If you guys know your gaming history, you know the Tiger GameCon is an incredibly just horrible console. So that was my worst. I had a. Uh... I had a lot of consoles. I think I've had most of the consoles that have come out, but I can't think of one that I regret getting. I had the Sega CD, the 32X. You never regret the 32X? Oh man, that was the first time I ever played Doom. I was oh yeah, it was, out it was nice for on Doom. Doom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Sega CD. You loved know are... I loved it. I played Snatcher on Sega CD. One of my favorite uh, games of all time. One of them is being re-released. I don't know if it's Sewer Shark or Snatcher, but being re-released on PS4. The first uh, time I switched on a uh, PC and booted up a game, I immediately regretted all consoles with equal viciousness. <laughs> Both you past, sack present, of and shit. Future. Handheld, though, Vita, man, never regret that, baby. I did actually regret the original 3DS, the first one. That was shit. Really? The original 3DS was awful. It was a really crappy, vinyl, plastic, bulky-looking piece of crap with pointless 3D that no one ever used, so bad that they took it out of later models. You know, what one was that? So there's the DS. That was the first clamp shell design, right? Then the and DSi. Then huge the DSi. I bought the DSi. I, I think I regret that because I don't think I ever played a game that was actually a DSi game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> Gary, the DS Lite was nice. That was the Gary, good one. That, that was had the nice. GBA cart. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, know. you know what? In the DSi, it was really nice because it was, it, was, it was black and it was flat black and it was comfortable. But you know what? I'm sorry, Nintendo. Never mind. I take it all back. <laughs> Gary, I just, just quick question, Gary, because for the 3DS to be one of your worst consoles of all time, did you ever play like the Sega Game Gear or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I the, had a the Game, Game Gear was great if you had a awesome. sack of batteries. I got two of them right there. If you had a sack of double A's next to you, you were fine. You were good to play for about three hours. I had a hey, rechargeable battery that was like this big and it had a belt clip. <laughs> it was like, it was no, literally I mean, like this I big. I can see Briar. Right next it to Briar's fanny pack. It was like the size of a 20-ounce Coke bottle. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, the thing that triggered me with the 3DS was how garbage the unique selling point of it was. I bought it with Ocarina of Time. Um, and I think I had it on 3D in the store. And then for about two hours afterwards, before realizing this is shit, I just turned the 3D off and never used it again. And until they did revisions of the body, I wasn't really happy with it because I felt like they've made significant concessions in graphics to get this thing 3D. And I think gotcha. Nintendo have even admitted that it was a, a, a pointless direction to go. They like to innovate, but that was a bad innovation. So, All right. So the next question comes from Arkham Knight 2. What video games have you guys bought on the Steam summer sale so far? Any recommendations? Oh, boy. <laughs> I can go through all 152. If you guys have got <laughs> half an hour, I can start. Um, I, some I, highlights. Through. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I've just bought a lot of series. So if I've seen things like... I've got an OCD. If I like a game... I can't just buy Far Cry 3. I've then <laughs> got to buy every single Far, Far Cry, Cry that I've made. <laughs> and Steam are great because they say, would you like to buy the bundle? And you're like, of course I'll buy the bundle. Why would I not buy the bundle? Why not? So yeah, I've bought a lot of things. Anything that's like Call of Juarez, um, I'm really excited about playing because that series, the, the Western shooter, have you guys played that, the first person shooter? No. Oh, it's really good. The good thing about that series is that it started strong got really shitty and ended strong. So I get to play that, that slump. That oh, arc. Yeah. <laughs> really good. All right. So the next question is, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, Brian. The, first of all, I didn't oh, answer I the question, but I got a follow-up question to Gary. What is the game that you bought that you know damn well you'll never play? 
90 percent of them. <laughs> I just said 90 of them. I bought um, a few of those like Baldur's Gate style games, like uh, Pillars of Eternity, oh, Path God. of the Exile, yeah. Grim Dawn. Because I like action RPGs. Yeah, they're so great games, play. but man, they're like they're their time is fast. Yeah. Shit. Yeah, I don't know. Well, what about I you, bought, bro? Uh, what did you buy? I bought Vanquished, which I'm actually really excited about. That's the Ooh. old uh, the old game console only game that yeah can't, just recently got kind of remastered for the PC, and apparently it's fantastic. Uh, so I saw that come up for a Steam sale, and I was very excited to snatch it up. Actually, I'm lying. I don't even think that was on Steam sale. I think that was just... I bought that at a normal price. Uh, I bought XCOM 2, uh, which I'm really excited about. I still haven't played that. I bought that for, I don't know, however much off. Um, I bought Wolfenstein, The New Order, and The Old Blood. Uh, I'd already played The New Order, but seeing that trailer for Wolfenstein 2 got me really excited, so I decided to to grab it and get the DLC, the new blood, which I'd never played. Uh, and that's what's kind of sticking out in my head. I bought a couple other things too, but they're not. XCOM though, I probably never will play it. I just, I want to play it, but one of those games I'll probably just never get around to. Yeah, I played XCOM too. It's one of those games I feel the same way. I I'll just be totally honest. I was at the Steam summer sale today. I was looking through the games. My yeah. wife came and sat down here. I told you guys pre-show. She said, turn that shit off. And so, yeah, I want to stay married, so I had to come back to the PlayStation. I'll get back to you next week. The next <laughs> question is from Ed Smiley. Do you think there, they will, there will be a preload for Destiny 2 beta? If so, when? I haven't heard anything about a preload, to be honest with you. Um, was there a preload for Rise of Iron? I can't remember. Oh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. I haven't heard anything about it. I'd like to see it happen. Um, I don't remember them ever doing it in the past. Okay. Gary, you have any thoughts on it? I guess not. All right. So <laughs> the next question comes from X Evan Powers XX. After seeing the Xbox One X, how long do you think it will be before Microsoft leaves the idea of console generations behind in favor of more frequent incremental upgrades? I don't think that's more frequent? to be taken to grant, for granted at this point. I think they'll be doing a lot of research on how well this went over, how it affected their brand, how it's likely to affect their brand in the future, how successful it was, how successful it was for gamers, and how successful it was for developers. Did developers take advantage of that extra power? Did you know? Did consumers find that there was value in that five hundred dollar console? I think they're taking a. I think they and Sony are both taking a kind of chance, uh, but it's an experiment that we'll see if it's successful or not. Um, probably very in a very long time from now, if if we see a PlayStation Five Pro or an Xbox. Two next, <laughs> yeah, next. <laughs> you know, it's like, called next. I don't, next. I, yeah, I don't know. I think that we got to wait to see if they they think it's a success or not. This and it's not just the uh, like Briar says, not just the Xbox One X. This isn't something that Sony's been looking at for a while too with the PlayStation Four Pro. the The Xbox One X and the PS Four Pro have tons in common. Uh, the Xbox is just slightly more powerful, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, Gary, you have any thoughts on it? Okay. So, Mr. BQNG says, have any of you played Revolt Evolution of Gamers? If so, what do you think? He's waiting I, I for the console release. I am the Evolution of Gamers. I am literally Shit! a gamer uh, evolved to at the highest level. Uh, I, don't need a, I don't need any validation or, or explanation. That's how it is. <laughs> oh, I love the next question, Brad, because I know it's aimed directly at you. At Serial Six V One Six, ask how long before the community finds things to complain about in Destiny Two. We, oh, we, we haven't even played it yet. We're already complaining. Oh about wait, it. <laughs> never mind. Thoughts? Yeah, we, we haven't even played it yet. People are already complaining. Oh wow. <laughs> the next question <laughs> is geared directly towards me, I guess. Uh, at Tucker Thirty Five Iyer says, "Pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Absolutely." Every yeah, pizza yeah. I eat has it's pineapple bump. on it. 
Fist Boom, bump, baby. Right there. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Fuck Every those pineapple haters. Pineapple. Fuck them Fuck guys. Fuck those bitches. Fuck them bitches. You know what? And, and if you buy a, a frozen pizza and you don't have a can of pineapple at home, yeah. you slipping. Yo, you these, slipping. These dudes putting uh, like uh, peas on pizza, though? <laughs> no. What the fuck? You've gone too far. <laughs> That's a you fool. Are. That's yeah, you should have stopped at the avocado, motherfuckers, you California bastards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is directly for Briar. The last question of the, j- the day comes from <laughs> DJ Man 22681 You know who that is. There are. Will, <laughs> will there be a Pop-Tart breakfast hosted by Chef Briar at Guardian Con? If so, have the Florida State Fire Marshals been made <laughs> DJ man, I'm gonna hold that one off till 2018 when you can attend. <laughs> uh, just a pop tart, can't handle pop tart, bro. There was a Holy small shit. fire in a in the back of a Staples store one day. It may have been associated with me and a pop tart. <laughs> oh my god! And that's the last of our questions for today. Do you guys have anything you want to add? Uh, I gotta see Gary's face. He ain't saying shit. I'm um, having a little bit of a uh, emergency with a toddler and a wet mattress. So oh ooh. shit, <laughs> we'll end it there. I can understand. I was there last it's night. It's all good. I was there last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen the wet mattress. I saw that earlier today. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of BC Thoughts Live. We go live every Sunday at six o'clock p.m. at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. The show is also uploaded at YouTube at Briar's channel and the Beastly Gamer channel. If you can't watch the live video or see the video content, you can now listen to our show in podcast form on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Thank you again for hanging with the crew. We'll see you guys next next week at the same time, same place. Shh. You might wake the baby. We, we didn't even make a dick joke at the end. <laughs>